Well, good afternoon. Come on in. You can find a seat. Come on in and sit down. And welcome. My name is Randy Neiman. I'm the president and CEO at Stuart Peterson. And today I have the honorable privilege of introducing a dairy that's doing a number of things right. And you in the audience are in for a special treat today because they've also agreed to have their financial management team come up here and engage with you in a Q&A session. Now, I don't need to tell this audience that there are a lot of challenges in today's dairy business, whether you're managing through an expansion, whether you're hiring and retaining a group of employees, getting a good genetics plan in place, or even using technologies. And United Pride is doing a lot of those things very well. More specifically, uh, they're one of really our star clients. And the reason for that is they have a big picture understanding of the commodity markets, and more importantly, the impact that that has on their business. They've taken steps to manage those risks, and what's manage those risks, and really what that's done is that's created opportunities for them and their dairy today, but also created some unique opportunities for them as they work to pass their, their, their operation on to the next generation. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to John Pesco and Ed Gisserta to take us on a virtual tour of United Pride. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm uh, John Pesco, uh, this is Ed Gisserta. Um, we have United Pride Dairy, and we're located in Phillips, Wisconsin. Um, as you can see, pretty far north. We're north of Highway 8, so if I throw a couple haze in here after I get done talking, you understand that. But uh, um, not really a dairy area where we're at, um, but uh, a nice uh, place to live. Um, very well uh, tourist type of area. And, and then we have a large farm, and there's maybe just a few other farms in that area. Um, United Pride started in 1996. Um, my, Ed and I were both had individual farms, um, and we merged our farm together at that time, and uh, and it has kind of grown accordingly. Ed? And I, I want to I don't know if you can hear me okay, but uh, you know we're actually so far north that there's no H in north. We're so far north. You know, we're so far north. <laughs> But anyways, yeah, we started talking, and it just kind of made sense. Uh, you know, through communications, we uh, decided just to go instead of our own our own individual farms expanding. Uh, we went together, um, and as you can kind of see here, uh, we've kind of done uh, basically one step at a time, and and we've kind of made the joke that we don't know how to sell cows, so we keep building barns and barns and barns. And Well, this is my, my original home place. Uh, um, my family settled in Phillips in 1911. Uh, I'm a third generation farmer. I started in 1982. I took over from my father with uh, 60 cows, and I grew it to about 100 cows. And as Ed said, we kind of we were looking at expansion in 1994. And um, as we kind of moved forward, uh, um, we, we decided to talk together and get, get going. I'd like to introduce my family members that are here. Uh, I've got my wife, Sherry, and my daughter, Trinity. And, uh, and then I have uh, my son, Jeremy, and my daughter, Kristen, and then Bill with a couple grandchildren, and, uh, and Stephanie with a couple grandchildren. Um, and they're all involved. Uh, uh, the boys are both involved in the farm. And um, actually, Stephanie does a little bit of the paperwork for us also. All right. There's, uh, I'm like many of you in this room. I grew up on your typical uh, Wisconsin uh, stanchion slash tight stall barn. I grew up with a registered uh, Guernsey herd. Actually, that picture is a little hard to see, but that was a, a promotional thing the old Badger Breeder Co-op had. It's probably about this big. It was up in our attic for years from 1966. So I, I, so I have that up in my office upstairs now. Um, and I went into partnership with my parents. I tried a few different things. Um, like I always tell people I have cows in my blood, so I came back to the home farm, went into partnership with my parents in 1990, um, took over the home farm in 1993. And as John mentioned, we started talking shortly thereafter. Um, I'd like to introduce my wife, Lori, is here. And my son's... Mitchell's standing next to me, and then Evan's next to Lori. They're both students at UW-Eau Claire right now. Actually, I see my sister Gloria snuck in. She's 
You can wave your hand and her husband Jim. So they <laughs> well, Ed, why don't you talk about um, you know when we came in to the partnership? I guess the, the phone call that I got while I was milking cows one day. <laughs> I was at a, I was uh, I think you know one of the smaller wasn't an expo it was a smaller trade show and I was talking to a builder. And I was asking him about, at the time I had my 60 cows, I was thinking about going to 120, switching cows or whatever. And he goes, well, your neighbor's thinking about putting up a barn. And I'm like, well, what neighbor? And uh, it was John. And, then, you know, John and I are like five years apart, so we, we never went to school together, but we played softball together and, you know, had equal respect or mutual respect for each other. And, and I mentioned that to my wife, Lori, and my dad. And, and that was kind of interesting, you know, and, and then my dad actually kind of mentioned, well, maybe you should talk to John. And then we talked about it a little bit, and, and I think I called John. He was milking cows at the time, and I'm sure he was like, what? You know, when I first mentioned it to him, but, uh, you know, what would you think about doing something together? And then your response was pretty interesting, I thought. Well, you know, I says, it, it, you know, with such a big investment, we were all kind of set up to expand to about 300 cows with the freestyle barn. But I said it would be really foolish not to look at this, you know, as, you know, dairymen used to get together and, and do things together. And, and this way it could kind of help share assets instead of, you know, both building separately. And, you know, it made some sense. And one of the things that, I, that helped me with this project was that, um, I was on the Wisconsin Dairies Board at that time. And at that point, Wisconsin Dairies and Golden Guernseys merged together. And I said, if two good cooperatives can get together and make a better cooperative, why can't two farmers get together and make a better, better group for farming? So. I'll let you go first. Okay. I guess I am on the left. Well, I don't know about the whole, so I'm up there, the genetics. Basically, I breed a lot of cows. Um, we don't do a whole lot of female merchandising and exporting, but we do work, we'll touch on this later, with uh, Genex, with their Genesis program. Um, so I guess if you broke up our, our, our roles a little bit, I guess I would call myself more of the herd manager. So that's kind of why I like this whole thing. I didn't really like the concept of farming, being the whole jack of all trades, but I really like the cows. So that's kind of what's made this situation kind of unique. My wife, Lori, helps with... Uh, Keeping everything look really nice. She picks up after a lot of the employees, which is a really hard job. Uh, mows the lawn. We have a bunch of bulls at our place, and she helps me take care of those every morning. And like I mentioned before, Evan and Mitchell are off at college. Yeah, as we, as we look for our roles and responsibilities when we started, it was basically a year-long process. How do you tie a, uh, two farms with different equity levels together and, and what kind of roles and responsibilities? But one thing that was very easy for us was that, you know, Ed was a lot better with the cows than I was. So I didn't need to do anything with that. So, you know, I worked more with the, with the you know, basically machinery, you know, at that time, just a few employees um, and, and kind of more on the business plan type of stuff. So it worked, it worked really well that we weren't stepping on each other's toes so much. But, you know, we certainly know what each other is doing, you know, especially in, in large decision-making processes, if there's something going on, you know, you know, obviously we talk. We're, we're not real big into formal meetings, but uh, we like to go golfing, both of us do, and we tend to talk a lot when we're doing that, so. <laughs> a few star um, words. So anyway, uh, my job is uh, managing employees and, and business planning. Um, you know, I have, I was associated with the cropping a little bit more. We're trying to bring the next generation in, and Jeremy and uh, Bill would be uh, my son and my son-in-law. Uh, so there, I'm giving some of the responsibilities to them to uh, make sure that they are ready, you know, and as we move on and stuff going forward. Uh, Sherry does bookkeeping and human resources. Um, um, her main job is scheduling, and one of the things that we do, we're, we're probably, what we try to become is, uh, um, let me think of the right word here, uh, a, a place of choice to work, and, and we have probably over 100 applicants that have applied at our place just this year. And part of that reason is that we will schedule to the people's jo jobs, you know, where they say, you know, I've got, my son has a volleyball game, can we rotate around? We, we do a lot of that. And, and, you know, if you look through human resource, you know, and if you, they schedule what's really important to the people, it's, it's time. You know, they want time. And so they're not so worried about how much they're getting paid you know, of course that's important, but they're more worried about, 
you know, if I need to go see this, can I do this? And so we have a lot of people on staff that we go basically, we'll rotate them around, and that's a big part of Cherry's job. And I think that's why we have so many people apply for us at our farm. Um, like Sherry or Jeremy, he's, uh, he's been kind of taking over the crops and the machinery and nutrient management. And then at his, we have uh, three separate farms. The, the main dairy is at my home place. Uh, Ed has the bulls over at his place. And then we bought a, a, a heifer farm about eight years ago, and he lives there. And we have 500, uh, 700, 800 heifers over there. So he kind of watches that. Bill, Bill is in charge of uh, sand recovery and uh, the milk trucking and a lot of the trucking issues that we have. And then his main job is railway way distribution, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then when he came to us, he came with a business degree from UW-Green Bay. He um, um, was looking for a business to run on his own while working for us. And we were jobbing our calves out at the time. And so we thought that that would be a good way for him to get into the management. And so he started quality calf care that is on our place, but basically he has his own set of employees and, and we pay him a fee to, uh, to take care of the calves up to six weeks of age. Well, we started, you know, we, we, had, we started with about 300 cows. Uh, we brought our own 150 in. We bought 150 and we put a double eight parallel parlor in our tie stall barn. And, um, like Ed said, we just can't sell good animals, so we just keep slowly building and building and building. Um, certainly, you know, keeping raising healthy calves, we've had a, a, a tremendous increase in our, in our population by always having extras. And, and you know, it, it's a good problem to have, but, you know, it also keeps all the builders happy, too. So... <laughs> All right, so then we talked about 1996, and we, we had this double 14 literally stuffed in John's old tie stall barn, and we, we did really well on that thing, but it was falling apart, and it was time. It was probably a couple of years past due. But anyway, so our big step here was to go from 950, roughly 1,000 cows, up to 1,800. Um, so in, uh, two years ago, I bought, went out and or we, bought, we, we purchased, I went out and sourced uh, about 750 heads, not all springers, kind of a combination of... Uh, Existing herds and springing cows. Uh, as you can see here, we put in a 60 cow rotary. It's a deal of elf. Uh, and then there's a 1,200 cow, 1200 cow cross ventilated freestyle barn. Um, so, anyway, I don't know if you want to touch yeah. base on that a little bit here. Well, we, you know, it, it came down to we were a permitted farm here. Um, I think we went through two permit processes, and in 2009, we, we didn't have six months manure storage. And we were right probably around 900 cows possibly at that time. And, and we were going, well, which way do we want to go? And, you know, we could, if we stayed the way we were, we have very level fields and, you know, we, you know, we could handle nutrients the way we were during the wintertime. Or we would have to go to six-month storage. And, and I think that was a turning point. You know, you're coming into 2009 with low milk prices and everything, and we're going to go, where do we want to go, you know? Do we want to go backwards? And, and, and I look at farms down the road, and, and somebody decided not to put in a barn cleaner. Somebody decided not to put a silo in. And, and it, where's the point where you stop and say, enough is enough? And, and I thought our business was a growing business, and the reason that we had a lot of people working for us it was the energy that they said, we're moving forward always. And I said, you know, short term, it didn't make a lot of sense. We would have been better off selling the cows and and basically getting underneath the permit level and continue to do that, do it the way we want, we're doing it then. But for the next generation and for the people that are working for us to keep those good employees, I think we needed to move forward. And so that's where we made the conscious decision, we're gonna be a growing business. If we're gonna put this manure pit up, okay, so now where do we need to go? What do we wanna be at cow numbers to move forward? And then, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where that played out. And, and that was tough, I mean, when, when milk prices are bad and and you're risking a bunch of equity, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, we're going to do it, you know, I mean, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's where we kind of came from, and, and, and it made a lot of sense, and, and certainly, I guess, we're glad that we did that. Okay. Uh, the parlor, uh, you know, we, we've, we mentioned the first freestyle barn, and then we built another half, and the other half of it in 1998 and 2000, and we built another freestyle barn, and 
2008 and then 2009 with the anticipation that we were going to put another parallel parlor, a new one, kind of in the middle of all those barns. And, and uh, maybe it was foresight on their part, but uh, Bob's Dairy and uh, D. Lavelle sent us out to California to uh, the World Egg, Egg Show and uh, uh, D. Lavelle uh, parlor tour. And uh, the first one I went to, we were just amazed by how calm the cows were, and they just loved getting on and off that rotary. And, and we just thought, wow, this guy's got really calm cows. And then we continued to see the same thing happening the next day. And I wouldn't say we fell in love with it, but I guess my word is we kind of had a man crush on that thing. <laughs> so then, like, okay, this is going to, you know, that's the other joke we make is, well, this is going to cost us more money. So then we get back to Wisconsin, and like, wow, that rotary is really nice, and I'm looking on YouTube and anything, you know, there's goats in Germany jumping on a rotary and all this stuff I'm looking at. And, and anyway, so then we went and looked at one that was built in northwest Wisconsin and just loved the rotary still, and then they have a cross-ventilated freestyle barn. So we go out there and walking through that and another man crush so we're like so here's a cross ventilated freestyle barn in the works too so I think that's the next slide maybe but uh, well anyways um so with all that being said so we decided to go with the rotary uh, we love the cows seem to like it it's real efficient and um, actually they don't want to get off which is kind of an interesting problem um, and this this is kind of our cluttery herds person office here at times but it's kind of a combination. When I had 800 cows, I used to feel fairly good about walking around every day and looking at the cows. And because we didn't have everyday milk weights, we, you know, you had to literally get out there and try to see cows and pick up. You know, we'd temp the fresh cows, but you, you'd miss stuff. So, and uh, so with the new parlor, we put the pedometers, um, so we get the the heat detection and the daily milk weights uh, three times a day, conductivity, all kinds of different stuff. So with a combination of you know, with that technology, and every other industry seems to love technology except for, you know, agriculture, we're not supposed to use technology, but I think it's a wonderful thing. So it helps us not only with the AI programs, but the herd health and whatnot. So it's been a great tool for us. That picture up on top, I think it was a group of fourth graders. We had all the county fourth graders out uh, two years in a row now through uh, farm tours. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the man crush is a great, uh, definition but we have two two main ways that we farm is one take care of the cows they'll take care of you take care of the land it'll take care of you and and when we went to look at the rotary we just said that's the best way to milk cows hands down and and that's that's what you got to look for long term if we're going to be in this business long term you know that that makes the most sense to us And I had mentioned the, the cross vent barn. Is, uh, so we have 1,200 milk cows, so that's 1,200 stalls. We, uh, we do overcrowd about 10%. So there's almost, I think there's 1,300 cows in there, and we have uh, about 400 in a conventional freestyle barn that's attached to the holding area in the back of the parlor. We use one of the other, which was, prior, was a prior milking cow barn for breeding age heifers and springers. And the very first freestyle barn we built is now for dry cows and uh, prefresh cows. Um, yeah, we, Don mentioned we had heifers at three, three miles one direction, and we have bulls five miles the other direction. So we're a little, little spread out, but not too bad. Ed, maybe, maybe you want to talk a little bit. Since, since we have both type of uh, barns, talk about uh, the, the summer heat. Now, mm -hmm. we're in northern Wisconsin, so you know, it snows basically every month. There. <laughs> but but um, you know that we do hit, get some heat once in a while, usually for a, a couple days anyway. And and it, it kind of talk about uh, the Fourth of July heat and, and how the cross ventilated barn uh, compared to the the four hundred cow freestyle barn. Well, I don't have numbers to show you in here, but um, actually, yeah, as far north as we are, you know, we get teased about being in permafrost and all that stuff. But we did have ninety five, ninety seven degrees with the high humidity, so it felt like one hundred and ten some days and. And I can remember breeding cows thinking these cows aren't going to settle. But, you know, we can still get cows pregnant in that barn. Um, we don't have any water, but it's, uh, there's 80 fans on the north wall, so we're getting a 10-mile-an-hour breeze under the baffles. And then when the cows come in the holding area, we're soaking them, getting them good and wet, dropping their body temperature. And uh, so I think just that's been a good combination. And the milk, you know, we took some milk hit with the heat, but it's not as severe, and it doesn't last as long as it does in our conventional freestyle barn. So 
we're all happy with that, the heat part of it. And also in the wintertime, it doesn't get as cold in that barn, and we get really cold. And with our manure system that we have now, it's, if it's 20 below outside in the morning, we can still keep it in the upper 20s. We don't have any heaters in our waters, so it's, it's a really nice environment. Yeah, and I think that cold stress probably gets, uh, you know, last year was certainly not the norm, you know, for a mild winter. But, you know, when you get some real hard cold stress, I think that's hard on the cows. You don't see it as drastic as heat stress, you know, where that's just automatic. But I think it just weakens their immune system. And, and I think this cross ventilated barn is, uh, is a lot better way to handle it because we're, we're, we're temping that, uh, keeping that temperature a little bit uh, more uh, tempered. That's kind of the pictures of it there we have. It's basically like sliding two six row barns together. There's two feed alleys. There's four pens uh, with three rows of stalls each, 300 stalls in a, in a pen. Um, so there's the baffles I talked about. So basically we have 80 fans, we're pulling air across the barn and uh, we're using recycled sand. We were seeing like about a 10 mile an hour breeze right underneath the baffles where the cows lay. I think we had about a six, six mile alley, an hour breeze in, yeah. in, uh, in the feed alleys. Um, part of the 2009 expansion as we did the Menar Pit, um, we used sand for bedding, you know, the best, uh, what we feel is the best uh, for the cows. Um, wanted to try to figure out how not to to have the sand in our manure pit like we used to. So we went with the sand separation building. Um, it's a kind of a combination of uh, mechanical and then you can see in the background some sand in the lanes there. Um, we are getting 92% of our sand out right now. Um, um, I guess what you're looking at right there is basically getting the, the solids out of the manure. We have flumes that go through all the barns, bring the manure to here, uh, sand drops out in the first auger, and then uh, basically gets washed with our old parlor, our, our parlor wash water to clean the sand, and we're turning it over in a week. And uh, we felt that that was pretty fast, but we were kind of tight on building extra storage space. Our cell count is 140. 140-ish. Yeah, 140 yeah, 140-ish. Um, you know, could it be better? You know, maybe. Uh, we're maybe thinking of adding a shaker on the end to see about drying it a little bit quicker. But um, overall, we're pretty happy with that. Um, you know, talk to me in a couple years just to see how the mechanics all work, you know, as things start wearing out and things like that. You know, I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm happy the way it's working. Um, you know, what the maintenance will be, it will be the big thing in the future. Uh, so far, not too bad. And then we basically built a, a manure pit for uh, six months worth of storage. Um, that's when the permafrost is out there. Um, uh, we have a two-stage lagoon that uh, basically ca ca captures most of the solids. We use a, a hose um, in northern Wisconsin. My average field size is about 10 acres, and we farm about 3,000 acres. So <laughs> we have over 300 fields. And so we, we basically we go about three miles with the hose. We set up a frack tank there, and then we, we hit different farm or different fields in that area. Um, We do have ample acreage for nutrient management. Uh, basically, we're, we're not big on buying Harlena commercial fertilizer. Um, th that field right there is about an acre and a half where that picture was taken. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of rocks underneath there. Um, we're a pretty high corn silage base. Uh, we had 1,600 acres of uh, corn silage. We went to... We went to 1,000 acres of uh, BMR corn silage this year. We've done a couple trials. We've been real happy with that. Uh, um, so we've, we've continuously increased that. Uh, we have a sandier soil, which is, is good because we need to get out in the spring early because our growing season is very short. Um, the elevation of Price County, the county that we're in, is very high. So we don't have a very long grow, growing season. Um, but Obviously, in dry years like this year, uh, sand is not the best, although we were very fortunate that we got plenty of rain until probably about the 1st of August. Okay, 
Uh, we began feeding whey byproduct called D-lactose permeate. Um, uh, nutritionist uh, Darren Bremer from VitaPlus asked if, um, if there was any plants that had this D-lactose permeate. There was a, a, a plant in Minnesota that was selling it to farmers. And there happened to be one in Wausau, Wisconsin, which was about 80 miles away. We uh, asked if we could try some because they were basically field spreading this whey permeate. And um, it was a replacement for corn. You know, corn was only uh, probably 450 a bushel at that time. And so we tried a trial for probably, I'd say, three months. And um, it, it, um, it did well. We replaced, we, we feed 12 pounds of this liquid and uh, replace four and a half pounds of corn in the ration. Since it works so well for us, we thought that you know, our, our neighbors and our friends would be interested in it too. So we formed a company called Railview Distribution where we would buy all the way from this plant and, uh, and then as it grew, uh, five other plants that we have. And uh, we're feeding 75,000 cows right now through Railview, all in semi-loads uh, of product that they take. Um, that's Bill Harper's full-time job, coordinating if the plant has six loads and we have a farmer that has 3,000 cows, he gets a load every day. You know, a farm our size gets a load every two days. You know, the smallest farm we have is the Iowa State Dairy College, Northeast Iowa State Dairy College, and I think they have like 140, so they get a load every month. And so his job is coordinating that out. All right, we'll keep this moving here. Uh, kind of talked about the herd a little bit. That's uh, about what our herd average is today, um, which whatever, you know, take away what out of a herd average. Um, we, I mentioned the Genesis program. We kind of started on the back of a tailgate. We were picturing cows probably about 10 years ago, and actually Lloyd Siemens in the audience here. We were sitting on the back of the tailgate afterwards, and they were kind of talking about their mowed program at the time. And, uh, and a couple weeks later, I got approached about uh, if we'd be interested in housing some cows for Genix. Uh, so it's been a real good relationship. So they, uh, we actually, so they retain the prefix on the animals that are born at our place. Uh, there's a lot more than that list, but that's kind of from last December's proofs. Uh, some of those names are probably familiar. So what we've been doing the last couple of years, like uh, the third bull down, if you can see co-op, it would be Genix's proof, and then we, we sneak in the UPD, so I guess, uh, so that'd be United Pride Dairy. So we got a few bulls uh, with that in their prefix there. So um, John mentioned earlier that Bill, we started this quality calf care. We struggled with calves. We're not real proud of that years ago. And we were kind of looking for the, you know, the monkey virus or something, the silver bullet to fix it all. And it was just a lot of little things. And we tried jobbing out the calves, and it actually probably got a little worse than what we were even doing. And then, and then we started figuring out some stuff, and then we brought Bill in. And my first reaction when John told me about that, I was just like, oh, my gosh. You know, he doesn't know. He hasn't raised calves before, and he hasn't been around cows before. But Bill's a very meticulous, orderly person, and that's what you need in that kind of role. So as you can see on the bottom uh, line there, it's been a great success. Yeah, he had no preconceived notions how to feed calves. You know, he basically just started reading things and goes, you know, it needs to be done this way. This is what we're going to do, and you know, and no shortcuts were taken. And, um, and he did a very good job with that. Um, we, you know, we try it out. You know, we're part of the community. I, I always tell the people that are driving truck or they have the name on the side of our uh, on the side of the truck. Go on, uh, you represent the farm at all times. I said, and and we win people one at a time. We lose them one at a time. And we need to make sure that we're out there. So, you know, whether it's bringing fourth graders in, um, being in the parade, um, we had dancing with the cows. We have a, uh, an area above that views over the, the rotary parlor. And we had a DJ up there. And, and, and we used the money for, Sherry, maybe you can help me what we used the money for? The local food pantry. The local food pantry right before Christmas. And so we had a bunch of people there for that. And, and we basically, last year was both of our 100th anniversaries being there. So we tried to do something every month last year to celebrate 100 years of farming in the Phillips community. Managing through uncertainty. Um, maybe I'd like to bring Matt up here. <laughs> 
and uh, maybe he can kind of talk about uh, how this played out. This is Matt Mackey from Stuart uh, Peterson, and he's my main advisor. We talk at least weekly, and and we email daily. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm Matt. Hello. And when um, it was in 2010 that we began a feed in and uh, milk marketing program for John and Ed. And in 2010, when they were getting their expansion started, it was vocalized to me just how important it was that things go well within that first year or two. Um, it's really critical as far as the long-term success of the dairy. So when we began um, putting together a strategy for milk and feeds, we took a more conservative approach as covering cost of production was, was crucial. And as time's gone on, and we've been looking at um, staying consistent with what we're doing for John and Ed. Our focus um, has shifted to building over time a solid weighted average price for them. And that's really key as far as long-term success goes. And if we go to the next slide here. When we talk about keys to success for United Pride Dairy, um, one of the big things is a clear understanding of goals and what the strategies are, and it's really a collective effort. Um, John, or, uh, Tim, Paul, well Tim's the business consultant, Paul's the banker. Um, it's important that we're all on the same page as far as what the goals are. And Tim provides the numbers and with how um, Ed and John do their marketing, they use primarily the hedge account. They don't do a lot of stuff through the milk plant and so that means it's important that the banker knows what kind of strategies we're looking to implement and what the capital requirements can be to implement those strategies so that the goals of the farm are met. And so the communication aspect is really critical and that's where biannual meetings and even sometimes more frequently, uh, more frequent meetings between the five of us, um, that's why we have those so that there's no lapses in what we're trying to accomplish for their farm. Matt, if I, I may interject, you know, I, I think that you know, we didn't talk a lot about it, but you know, coming out of 2009 when we wanted to go through this big expansion, you know, that, that, that's, that was tough, you know, to get a lender to even talk to you at that time. And, and you know, and, and we're gonna certainly drive our equity down as we spend all this money on the equipment that automatically depreciates. And so, you know, we had to take some of the risk out. And this is where Stuart Peterson certainly came in and, and basically helped us formulate a plan that said, you know, you know, we can't control the weather, you know, we can, we can control the cows pretty well, but you know, this kind of controls our marketing and our feed costs so that we, that we just continually slowly move forward. You know, at that point we were gonna be risking a lot of our equity and we couldn't afford for a global economy breakdown, something out of our hands that could take this out of, take it out of our hands. And so using the, the strategy that Matt has implemented has made that a slow incremental growth that you know that we continue to drive our equity up. So understanding the goals and being on the same page is one critical component to success. The other component to success that is key is knowing the weighted average price. And what the weighted average price is, it's it's a net price that United Pride Dairy is going to receive. And that price changes as market prices changes change based on what positions they have in place how much of their milk they have covered, and what tools are used to cover that milk. And so it's important that, um, with the next point, that we rehearse those price scenarios, that United Pride knows what price they're getting for their milk, no matter which way the market goes. A fourth component to success, kind of going off of the first one a little bit, is the communication. And as John said, we're talking frequently. Um, with how volatile these markets have been, there's been a lot of communication lately. When things are calmer, you know, the, the communication doesn't need to be as much. So it kind of cycles throughout the year as far as when things are really happen, when there's a lot of volatility, there's a lot of communication to make sure that we don't miss anything. And then other times of the year where, you know, less is needed when things get quiet. And then the last thing is consistency. Um, it's important that over time the approach doesn't change because markets will go up and down, but changing the approach can be a crucial mistake that can be made as far as when you look at bull cycles and bear cycles. As bull cycles um, advance and, and play out longer, there's always that desire to try to do less because as markets go up, there's less of a need for marketing. You really don't need to do anything because the prices are 
are um, at higher levels or at good levels, assumably. And so there's always that desire to kind of scale back. And that's um, a critical mistake that needs to be avoided. And there needs to be some level of consistency so that the approach stays the same through bull and bear markets. And that's where over time, as we talk about weighted average price here in a second, um, that helps to keep that in the forefront. So if we switch the, the slide forward, uh, rehearsing, the fu rehearsing the Future is um, a quote by Peter Schwartz. And basically what it gets at, it's about preparing in advance for all sorts of scenarios so that there's never a point in time where one is caught off guard um, and forced to scramble and try to get things back on track. So the more we can do pre-planning and the more we can think about all the scenarios that could happen, the less likelihood there is that we're scrambling and trying to chase a market. We're being more proactive and less reactive. So when we talk about how we accomplish that, um, looking at different scenarios is what we call market scenario planning. And this is something that John and I email back and forth on and have conversations on. And this is an example of something that I would email him ahead of any implementation of any strategies. What we want to do for United Pride Dairy is give them certain outcomes and let them know what the, what the implications are of the strategies that are looking to be implemented for their dairy. How is it protect them if prices go down? What kind of opportunities can they still partake in if prices go up? And this essentially does that. So if we look at the table at the top, the second row down, still in yellow, where it says, what if the price goes to? Those are the kind of scenarios we look at. What if milk goes to 14? What if it goes to 18? What if it goes to 25? What are the implications of the strategies we're putting in place to accomplish their financial goals? And the, the three lines below that show, depending on which strategy we choose, or depending on which strategy John and Ed choose, what the implications are on their overall weighted average price. So you can see, for example, under strategy one, if the market fell apart and went to 14 with that strategy in place, their overall weighted average price would be 1966 in this example. However, if the market went to 25, they'd be at 20, about 2040. And so what's um, key with this is it gives them certain outcomes and it gives John and Ed a, a chance to think about, um, or take all this in, think about where their average price would be um, at those various scenarios and determine which one they're more comfor most comfortable with, which one most accomplishes the financial goals that they're seeking to accomplish. So this is something that as far as, um, you know, what the goal is, the goal is to be prepared no matter what the market does. It's to have an understanding of the price they will receive for their milk no matter where the market goes. And they have the choice to choose between, you know, more conservative and less conservative strategies. Ed said that we were, you can see that we're a grazing herd. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that last slide we were talking about there earlier, John mentioned that's one of his favorite things to look at, and I think we have reasons why it's, his reason is different than mine. Mine's because it's got cool colors on it. That's what's neat about this being kind of departmentalized. I don't really worry about this stuff as much as, that's why you got to trust people. And uh, John, you, might, you mentioned that out there, so I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, Why you really like this? Yeah. <laughs> the, the well, yeah, I'm colorblind, so the bottom graph doesn't help me a lot. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, this this kind of kind of I can make determinations of going, you know, which strategy. And sometimes we use partials of all three. And you know, and you know, these numbers, you know, are real numbers that I can kind of put my hands around and go, okay, you know. Well, what are feed costs going to do? Well, you know, we're expecting that they're going to be a little bit higher, but you know. If I if I lock in a price, can we can we make a profit here? You know, going six months forward or whatever, and and I, you know, as you go through an expansion, I think it's more important to hit a lot of singles instead of hitting a home run. You know, I mean, for the people that say that they hit the market right all the time, you know, God bless you. But you know, I've never been able to do that myself. So I think it's better to have a, a good strategy in place and just um, and and take it in incremental growth. Okay, uh, forward through uncertainty. You know, I think we're, you know, we're going to continue to build that equity. Um, you know, we're, con you know, we're continuing to refine the management all the time. And then I think, you know, probably one of our biggest things coming to the future here is, uh, 
generational transition, you know, you know, making sure that all the people, players are, if they want to be involved, they can be involved, you know, and if they don't, that's fine, but, you know, how to bring that next generation in and, and to get them some skin in the game. Um, you know, I started farming at 21, Ed started farming 26, 27, you know, you know, we were making big decisions at that point already, you know, you, you need to let those, uh, the next generation make those type of decisions and some of them might not be the best, but you know, hopefully with our guidance, we can kind of help them through that and move forward and, and have the rainbow. <laughs> and the reason that was taken, that was actually on Facebook. Uh, uh, my son-in-law has a page there and, uh, and his Facebook comment was 10% chance of rain during first crop. <laughs> so, so obviously we got a bunch of hay wet, so. But the upside was that pot of gold is right on the other side of the parlor, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to bring up our team. Um, we've got uh, Paul Salm from BMO Harris. We've got Tim Swenson from Lookout Ridge and, and Matt uh, from Stuart Peterson. So we'd open it up for questions if. So as I promised earlier, this is your chance to ask some questions of the team, uh, and I'll kind of run around and hold the mic for you. So what questions do we have? Raise your hand and I'll get you the mic real quick. Yes, sir. Well, you haven't said anything about your feeding program. Are you using any DDGS or could I hear a little bit about the feeding program? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're using some dry distillers and uh, we're basically 68% uh, corn silage ration right now. We got a little bit of whey in there. Um, um, very little corn right at the moment. We, we don't grow any corn for grain at home, so we're, we're using the whey byproducts. A um, um, little bit of alfalfa haylage, um, and basically the, the general minerals. Um, I don't have specifics for you, but... Uh, canola is in canola. the right now. Yeah, canola is probably our biggest change from soybean meal. What other questions? Yes, sir. What are you doing to hedge feed cost? Matt? On the feed cost side of things, um, United Pride's been pretty well covered since um, this past summer and earlier. They've done a combination of physical purchases through their um, local feed supplier. We've also used the hedge account as far as call option coverage on their corn feed needs. So right now for 2011, or sorry, for uh, 2012, they're 100% covered. Um, they have been immune to this higher feed cost. And for 2013 at this point, with where prices are at, all we're looking at is basically options coverage. And um, what, what, what call options do, for those that don't know, essentially what they do is give you a worst case cap on your feed prices. So you know that if we have another weather event going into this next year, or something happens in South America, they know a worst case, what they're dealing with. And yet it leaves their opportunity open that if, um, the laws of economics take hold and prices go down, they're able to capitalize on that. So lately there hasn't been a lot done on feed prices just because um, feed hedging began last summer on the protein side of things. Um, we were done with protein coverage by December of 2011. And then corn coverage was done by um, late April, early May of this year. So. Good, what other questions? Uh, to your banker, as a, as a banker uh, working with uh, this uh, farm here and talking about their hedging line and that sort of thing, uh, what, what do you really look at and how do you manage uh, that hedging line with uh, United Pride? Well, I guess I got to start off to say it's just an honor to be up here with United Pride and the management team. I'm actually probably the last player that came to the table as they were approaching 2010 and, and this expansion plan. I don't think I met, uh, John and I were talking about this, I don't think I met them till like January 30th and on May 11th we were closing documents to do this and, and that goes to the, the, management, the management team that they have in the back up with uh, Lookout uh, Ridge as a consultant and uh, Stuart Peterson on their hedging but when they came to me they were 100%, they had recognized that risk of price and, and a major expansion and draining their equity um, and they were 100% uh, uh, locked in. How do we handle a hedging account? Um, if, you, if you don't know the transition, uh, uh, you might not recognize BMO Harris Bank, but uh, that's M&I Bank. On Tuesday, we switched to BMO Harris Bank. Uh, so M&I has been in the uh, agricultural industry in Wisconsin, a very strong player there. 
But we have uh, specific lines set up for their hedging accounts. So we have a separate from their operating line, their hedging account. Uh, uh, John probably uh, had more stress in the increases in the hedging account as the prices go up than, than what we do inside the bank. So we use a one, and, and maybe that's unique. I don't know what other lenders do, but we use one-to-one. -one. What you're plugging into that market uh, is, you know, got to be covered by a hedge line. It can't come out of operating. Um, so we set those lines up uh, appropriately to do that. Um, and, and the key is, it's so, you know, to me it's just simple. If you're going to lock in the price, we got to ride it to the top and let it come down. You're producing the product, so you're going to get the same net result. So um, uh, it's a concern if, uh, if your lender wants to limit the amount of hedge you have and you have to unload your position before it's time. Yeah, that, that was, it was, they're very good with that. You know, I, I, get, I get more heartburn you know, not as much as me talking right now, but I get a lot of heartburn when that hedge account goes up. And, you know, and I call Paul and I says, you, you see what's going on there? He says, it's okay. He says, you know, it's going to come back. And, and that makes it a lot easier for us. So, Tim, Tim, you're shaking your head there. You have a comment you want to add in? Yeah, you know, we, we just, you know, I keep track of that separate, and as it plays back out, I make sure that, that I'm replenishing that and not buying a new tractor or something. And having a separate hedge account is a line with your financial institution is the key, because if you were using your operating account to do that, all of a sudden we get around to spring and your operating account is all in your hedge and you have no money to put uh, inputs into the ground, uh, it's, it's not a, a good place. Where it's separated out of your operating line, you know that that's just the market moving and we're okay because we locked in a price that was a profit. So. Follow-up question here. Uh, how do you uh, work the, uh, the expense and the income in your, operate, in your profit and loss statements and through your balance sheets and that sort of thing through, uh, uh, through your you know, working with the, the markets? Well, Tim, I'll let you. Yeah. Does that, okay. answer, does that answer your question? Okay, what other questions? We've got some time left, so this is your time to really uh, ask the questions of the panel here. Unique opportunity. Yes. Yeah. I guess it's twofold. How much time have you had to devote to learning, to educating yourself about marketing like this? And, and what advice would you have um, for others who, who might be considering um, a risk management program? Well, you know, when, we, when I started working with Stuart Peterson, um, you know, they, they basically kind of give you a tutorial that, that we kind of just really work through the, you know, the paperwork. And then just constant conversations with Matt going, you know, what are these strategies back and forth? And, and eventually you start getting yourself a little bit familiar. You know, you, you don't want to become too familiar where you become dangerous, that you think you know more than, you know, but on the same token, you get yourself more familiar on how th these marketing strategies are going. And, and as in anything, you know, when we, we learn in farming, you just need to keep, you know, just keep at it and working with it every day, then, then you, you just feel more and more comfortable with it. How about the second part of the question? Maybe this is for the whole panel. Uh, what advice would you have for uh, folks that aren't familiar with some of the tools? Uh, 
I guess I'll start there. Um, I guess line yourself up with someone that you trust and uh, and that will that understands your business. And I think that's what Stuart Peterson has gained with United Pride. Um, it, for the producers in there, if you want to have a key document to add to that balance sheet income statement that your uh, that your lender is going to ask you for, is have a risk management plan. I mean, that's that's one risk. You know, it's feed risk, it's livestock risk, it's labor risk, it's uh, uh, succession plan risk. You know, what have you done with all those in crop the crop risk? So uh, that's really becoming the key as you're moving forward is knowing where those risks are and how am I offsetting that? And obviously. You know, financial risk is, is handled by Lookout Ridge, and, and marketing risk is Stuart Peterson, um, and uh, it handles all the animal risks uh, uh, by his quality uh, operation. So, T Tim, do you want to comment on what advice you might have, and then maybe Matt, you'll have some thoughts on the um, education side. Echo many of the things that Paul was saying. It, it really does come down to, to uh, linking yourself up with somebody that you're comfortable with, because that communication on, on what that strategy that you're trying to implement is, is extremely imperative. And, you know, uh, have it work with, with somebody that, that can grow with you so that if you, if you are starting out at, in, in your marketing strategy, don't be doing something that, that you don't understand and that, that your, that your um, advisor can't explain to you. Start out simple and, and build forward. And as, as you learn, you can start implementing different strategies. That, that ability to link up and communicate is probably the where I see it um, having a huge success or having huge failures on, on all the farms. Okay, great. Matt, anything to add? Yeah, I guess the one piece of advice I would have as far as those considering risk management is really think about how committed you are to it. Uh, because there's, you know, there's a lot of dollars involved with markets, prices swinging up and down, and there's a lot of emotion that gets attached to, that, um, gets attached to those dollars, and for good reason. And so when you get emotion drawn in, brought into it, when prices are low on milk or when prices are high on feed, there's really that motivation that, boy, I gotta do something now. And then you get started on it, and then prices improve, say, on milk, or feed prices go down, and then there's that desire to, well, I don't need to worry about this anymore again. And so there's this, that constant on and off again marketing. And the biggest advice I'd have is that if a person is considering doing it, decide how committed you are. And if you're not committed to it for the long haul, through the ups and the downs, then it's not something for you. It, there's this, marketing can provide a, a lot of good things. It, it can create success. However, there has to be consistency tied to it. Tied to it. And if the consistency is there, then it's going to fail. And that's, that's the bottom line. So that's what I would say is you've got to be committed to a consistent approach. Otherwise, it's not going to work. OK, next question. Um, as, as the producers, do you spend daily time watching the markets or do you just discuss strategies with with Matt and then let him worry about the the you know hitting price goals or targets you know as the markets move yeah you know I, I look at uh, Stuart Peterson sends out a, a, a daily email and I look at that email but really uh, there's not a lot that I'm going to change daily you know it's a long-term approach um, you know, certainly if markets move a lot in one day, you know, Matt and I may talk and, and some, some of the, the points that we've set up in the future may be hit at that, at that day and we'll go, do we want to, you know, do we want to implement a strategy today for 10% or 20% of our milk or 10% of our feed, however that plays out. But those are already drawn out, you know, when we have our basically quarterly meetings that, that this is where we want to go. And so, you know, there is no... I guess I don't spend a lot of time just going, you know, looking at my phone going, oh, geez, the market's doing this, you know. I, I don't spend a lot of time doing that. If I can add on to that, the one thing we really try to do is, is pre-plan and have things laid out and communicated ahead of time. Because the last thing I want to do is, is, is call John when he's in a tractor or, or tied up with something and, and force him to make a decision um, on the spot there as far as feed's doing this or milk's doing this. And so what we want to do is have things communicated ahead of time give John time to think about it. So going back to that chart you saw with the, the, back the prices and then the scenarios table, we want to have that communicated ahead of time and um, email it to John so he can have some time to think about it and make sure he's comfortable with it. And it, so it's more of a, a longer term um, approach so that there's not those knee jerk reactions or not those last minute phone calls trying to put stuff in place. 
Just switching gears a little bit, uh, you talked about bringing two organizations together uh, to form United Pride. Uh, did you have uh, uh, the consulting firm uh, working with you through that whole process uh, to develop your business plan, or did you bring them in later? And you thought, well, geez, we had some screw-ups. We better bring them in to straighten it out. Or how did that whole process go uh, for you? Uh, it was a little bit of an unknown because it's a little bit unique, you know. But the one thing we did have, and we have a lot of things in common, but one thing our families both had in common, we both worked with the same attorney that's done many, many transitions from parents to children and all the farm transition stuff. And we went and talked to him right away. And I remember the first thing he told us is he kind of sat back and go, oh. And then he goes, well, the first thing we got to do is figure out how to break this thing up if it doesn't work. And that was 17 years ago. But anyway, so it was a learning process for all of us. I mean, you know, like John mentioned earlier that, it, you know, the uh, what's now uh, Foremost Farms, that was a unique situation there. Obviously, you know, it's not parallel to what we did as far as size and whatever. But uh, so it was a big learning process for all of us, I guess. And it was learn as we go. And uh, I don't know if there was any huge regrets. But, uh, no, no, and, and you know, I mean, we did, you know, with the banker that we were working at, at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot of these out there, but we did, uh, you know, obviously we were consulting him as we were trying to set up, you know, the loan portfolios and things like that. So, so we did have some help. We did come down and actually talk to some people in Madison, but you know, we're talking a long time ago. <laughs> and but but you know, you know, we we tried to bring people in to help us move this together. And, and like I said, you know, it, it took probably about a year for that to go, you know, I mean, we get together at a kitchen table maybe once a month and go, well, does this make sense, this makes sense, and, you know, and eventually we, we got it straightened all out. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. Ed's got the mic, so if anybody has any heard or uh, <laughs> other questions, now would be a good time to ask those as well. Yep, yes, sir. How did you manage the uh, different equity levels of the two partners initially? Well, I think the, the main thing was we, we went to a 50-50% partnership, but then we basically, we rented in or sold in, you know, our equity, at, you know, as the, the actual cost at the time. So since our equity levels are different, you know, there was different rent checks that came in, and we kind of just kept balancing those out because we thought it was really important to be 50-50 partners, not having somebody with more equity than another. That way, you know, it, it seemed like, you know, we didn't want one railroading the other one on different things. I think it made it more common. But, you know, the draws coming back, you know, compensated us for those equities until everything was merged into the farm. Okay, we've got time for one last one. Give me one last question. If not, I'll call on you. <laughs> Got one more? <laughs> Any more questions? One more opportunity. Yes, sir. You have a 50-50 now. How are you going to bring in the next generation? Uh, hey. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, <laughs> great way to finish, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's going to be one of our biggest uh, uh, challenges as we go forward. Uh, you know, we're going to certainly use... Uh, the consultants to bring this in, see what other people have done, you know, tailor make it to our own. Um, you know, I, I don't have the answers. It, it, it's not going to be as easy, but you know, can it be done? I think it can. You know, you know, the main thing is to be fair and equitable. You know, during this, straightforward. You know, keep everybody involved. Uh, we've we've kind of done some initial discussions with Lookout Ridge. They have. Uh, uh, a transition uh, person on their team and and basically we kind of talk about everybody's goals you know what's you know what my goal obviously is different than Ed's uh, you know my son and son-in-law's goals are different than either one of us so um, we'll have to tie those all together and uh, you know that might be something to talk about two years from now. <laughs> Tim I'm looking at you do you have any comments to add in this area? on those 
a given area. So they, they have started that process already by, by having some of these uh, connected businesses. And, and you know, I think that's really uh, got the, started the process for them and, and allowed everybody to kind of to kind of step into the transition process instead of leaping off a cliff. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. You know, the, the quality calf care for Bill. When Railview came up, Ed and I said, geez, we have enough things to do, you know. So, you know, the good news is you guys get to be partners. The bad news is you guys got to run it. <laughs> and so, you know, and so, so we basically, they're the main driving force behind those two. We're 25% we're partners in that, and, but they're doing all the work. We got them kind of associated with the business and, you know, accounts receivable and all the good things that comes with that. And I think that's going to only make them stronger as they come into the, into the farm. Okay, we're going to bring it to a close here. Ed, any comments, last closing comments from you or from John before we dismiss? I'd just like to thank everybody for coming and thank this group that's standing up here to uh, get us where we're at today, and the future is exciting. So, Great, John. Thank you. Anything to add, John? Uh, no, he said it all. Thank you. Okay, please join me. Well, or thank the group. Uh, great job. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks. Thanks, man. Gosh, I'm